Welcome to this first in a series of Tuesdays with Merton webinars. My name is Teresa Sandock. I'm a Servite sister from Wisconsin and a member of the board of the International Thomas Merton Society. Before we get to our main event, I want to make a few short announcements. Tuesdays with Merton is sponsored by the International Thomas Merton Society and the Bernadine Center at Catholic Theological Union. The webinars are scheduled to run on the second Tuesday of each month. We are both delighted and overwhelmed by the response to this first webinar. Registrations far exceeded our expectations. We have a thousand people from around the world participating by Zoom and an overflow crowd of about a thousand more watching the event live on Facebook. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Father Daniel P. Horan, a Franciscan friar and brilliant young theologian. Dan is the SCOTUS Chair of Spirituality at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, where he teaches systematic theology and spirituality. He is a columnist for the National Catholic Reporter, the co-host of the Francis Effect podcast, and the author of 12 books, including The Franciscan Heart of Thomas Merton. He currently serves on the Board of Directors for the International Thomas Merton Society and is working on several Merton-related projects. His next book, due out in 2021, is titled, What We Have Done and Failed to Do, A White Catholic's Guide to Racism and Privilege. And now, here is Father Dan Horan. Thank you, Sister Teresa, um, and thank you to everybody who's joining us. As uh, Sister Teresa mentioned, we're uh, thrilled at the International Thomas Merton Society and at the Bernadine Center here at Catholic Theological Union uh, at the outpouring of interest and support. Uh, so whether you're joining us by Zoom or Facebook, please know you're most welcome and we hope uh, that you'll join us for these monthly uh, Tuesday with Merton offerings. Um, before I begin my prepared uh, remarks but, and then open it up to some questions, as Sister Teresa mentioned, you can send that information through the chat box. Uh, I'd like to begin with a prayer, and this is a prayer, at least a portion of a prayer service that uh, Bishop Ferdinand Cherie, the Auxiliary Bishop of New Orleans in Louisiana, who also happens to be a Franciscan friar, uh, prayed uh, earlier this summer in a uh, prayer service titled Requiem for Black Children of God. And so in a spirit of prayer, in a spirit of silence, in a spirit of Solidarity, let us pray. My brothers and sisters, the scars of systemic racism plague our nation, our communities, and our churches. For too long, too many of us stood silent or said too little as our black brothers and sisters succumbed by, uh, succumbed by the brutal blows of racism's cruel injustice. Let us say their names a litany for just some of those who bled and died on this punishing cross, and let us ask forgiveness. Rodney King, Sean Bell, Oscar Grant, Melise Green, Abner Luima, Trayvon Martin, Freddie Gray, Nathaniel Edwards, Rakia Boyd, Rafael Cruz, Harith Augustus, Michael Brown, Botham Jean, Laquan McDonald, Paul O'Neill, Isaiah Marietta Golding, Tamir Rice, Alton Sterling, Antoine Rose II, Eric Gardner, Philando Castile, O'Shea Terry, Sandra Bland, Sandra Bland, excuse me, Terence Crutcher, Devon Bailey, Betty Jones, Stefan Clark, Kenneth French, Walter Scott, Juan Flores, Michael Dean, Eric Harris, Marco Gomez, 
Bruce Carter, Tony Robinson, Eddie Lee Patterson, Genevieve Dawes, Rumaine Brisbane, Gus Tusis, Ahmed Arbery, Brianna Taylor, John Crawford, Ayana Jones, George Floyd, Daniel Prude. Oh God, forgive us for being a party to injustice in the lives of these, your children, our black sisters and brothers and all victims of systemic racism in these United States. Forgive us for not seeing them as co-heirs to life, to liberty, to the pursuit of happiness. Forgive us for not hearing their cries, I can't breathe, or hands up, don't shoot. Forgive us for not lifting them up as your children, precious in your sight. Increase our strength, we pray, O Lord, that we may drink deeply of love's power and everywhere promote your just, justice and peace. And we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. And the church says, amen. I never thought that I would live through a time that seemed as or even more chaotic, tensive, divided, uncertain, frightening, or more tumultuous than what has been described about the historic year 1968, a year of so many significant events, including protests for justice, assassinations of prophets, and calls for change that continue to echo through the decades into our own time. But here we are. It's 2020, and in the intervening 52 years, apparently we have learned very little in American society and in the church in the United States. For as much as we have personally and collectively witnessed, many of the systemic, structural, and institutional injustices that compelled women, men, and children to take to the streets and protest during the 1950s and 1960s continue and persist today. And among these continuing social evils is systemic racism. 1968 is also the year that Thomas Merton died prematurely at the age of 53. And though it is unlikely that he would have lived long enough to see this year with us, since he never had the chance, nevertheless, his writings and legacy leave us with resources that remain sadly all too timely and relevant, particularly on the topic of racism and what sort of response Christians, particularly white Christians, should have to what the Second Vatican Council calls the signs of our times. Speaking of white Christians, I should be clear from the outset to name my own social location, one that is not unlike Merton's own. I am a white cisgender male who is a Franciscan friar and a Catholic priest. Those descriptors, and there are others, are especially relevant here when we consider the subject matter at hand this evening, because we are talking about systemic racism and white privilege, which are always already interconnected and are two sides of the same coin. Therefore, it's important that I acknowledge the truth that I am an unwitting beneficiary of an unjust system of white supremacy in this country and in our church. Therefore, in talking about the history and aims of the Black Lives Matter movement, I am not doing so in an effort to speak for or on behalf of anybody, let alone any person or community of color. But instead in my reflections in, a, in an effort to open up as the series does, new avenues into the thought and legacy of Thomas Merton's writings and teachings, I instead speak for myself and from my experience. I also do so recognizing that my own socialization as a white man in the United States has formed me in a racist context, wherein I must consistently and consciously learn and relearn again the truths about our unjust society and challenge myself, as well as my fellow white Christians, to strive toward being better allies in the effort to dismantle white supremacy and advocate for racial justice. But because I have a very limited amount of time and there's so much that could and so much that should be said, let me get right into it. 
and suggest from the outset that what I will share this evening is only the tip of the iceberg. There are many more resources from Merton on racial justice, and in the Q&A in our discussion, I'm happy to make additional recommendations. So I intend to proceed in my prepared time here in two, two parts. First, I, I wanna talk a little about the Black Lives Matter movement, as well as its intellectual and activist roots and its significance for our time. Then I will present some of the resources and insights from Merton's own writing that continue to speak to the life and death issues at hand, particularly as it concerns white Christian responses to racial justice movements. So first, the meaning and importance of Black Lives Matter. To many people, the story is already quite familiar. The origins of the phrase Black Lives Matter as a distinctive slogan can be traced back to the horrific and senseless murder of a black teenage boy in Sanford, Florida on the evening of February 26, 2012. Trayvon Martin was walking through a neighborhood wearing a now famous hoodie sweatshirt and carrying a soda and some candy. George Zimmerman, a neighborhood watch volunteer, unilaterally deemed him suspicious. And despite being told by 911 operators to stand down and leave the kid alone, Zimmerman took it upon himself to initiate a confrontation with Martin, which ended in the volunteer vigilante shooting and killing the unarmed and unthreatening teenager. In the words of the scholar Christopher LeBron, Martin's only possible crime seemed to be walking while black. The following summer, Zimmerman was found not guilty on all charges related to Martin's death. And this was done by a jury upholding the now infamous Stand Your Ground law in Florida that in effect exonerated a man for murder on account of his own claim of feeling threatened. It was in response to this outrageous failure of justice that led three black women, each in a different part of the United States to engage in social media in a manner that had serious historical consequences. The women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors and Opal Tometi took to social media to express righteous anger and human solidarity in the wake of the Zimmerman acquittal. Garza was the first to write a post that went viral on Facebook, which read, and I quote, black people, I love you, I love us, we matter, our lives matter. Cullors, an, an artist and activist, shared the post with the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And with the assistance of Tometi, a New York community organizer, a movement with a powerful name was born. Speaking of movements, it's worth noting here that the phrase Black Lives Matter is reflective of a grassroots, decentralized, and diverse movement that has become a force demanding change in America. As one scholar notes, eschewing traditional hierarchical leadership models, this movement cannot be identified with any single leader or small group of leaders despite the role that these three women, Kohlers and Tometi and Garza played in giving us the social movement hashtag that will likely define our generation. Rather, hashtag Black Lives Matter represents an ideal that motivates, mobilizes, and informs the actions and programs of many local branches of this movement all around the world. This is a really important element to note because in recent months, Certainly since the unspeakable murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Arbery, just to name three, since those murders launched a worldwide series of protests this summer, several religious leaders, including some Catholic bishops, have sought to minimize or distance or even dismiss the Black Lives Matter movement on account of a misguided interpretation of one website and nonprofit foundation by the same name. These religious leaders have claimed that, quote, good Christians cannot associate with Black Lives Matter because some of the stated policy priorities on one particular organization's website, the ones that they list, are seemingly in opposition to established church teaching. I need to say very clearly from the outset, because I know it's something that some in our audience this evening may be thinking about. This is a lie, and it is a red herring, a distraction. This lie arises from either the ignorance of the church leaders expressing such claims, or perhaps even their willful desire to mislead the faithful. Either way, 
let me state clearly. Not only can good Christians and Catholic Christians specifically support, embrace, organize around, and advocate on behalf of Black Lives Matter, but I believe, and I think Merton's work suggests the same, that we Christians must do so. Sadly, this sort of failure on the part of some church leaders only adds to the harm experienced by women and men of color. As writer Olga Segura, who has a forthcoming book on Black Lives Matter and the Catholic Church reiterates, many Catholics of color feel that issues of racial justice are not sufficiently emphasized by church leaders. And, and I would add that their resistance to the movement and to the hashtag is case in point. This is made all the more urgent when we face the uncomfortable statistic that people like Father Brian Massengale have highlighted when he wrote in 2016 that white Christians are among the least likely even to believe there is systemic racism and that this is a problem. This afflicts Christians of all denominations, people of goodwill of non-religious traditions and Catholic Christians as well. Theologians Vincent Lloyd and Andrew Prevo explain the importance of Christians embracing the profound meaning of the, fate, of the phrase in their introduction to a book on Christian ethics and anti-Black racism. They write, Black Lives Matter. This is not only shorthand for a political program, it is also an affirmation of a truth that the world too often denies. Black women and men, girls and boys, young and old, straight and queer, Northern and Southern and immigrant and biracial, black humanity in all its varieties is beautiful, is dignified, is sacred, is loved. Doing all this, being human, when the world treats black life as disposable, that takes something special, something powerful, something supernatural. In black life, denied but irrepressible, we see the divine imaged in the human clearly. For those who do not face racial oppression, the dignity or sacredness of life may become but an abstract principle to be affirmed, and one that is sometimes affirmed at the same time Black humanity is denied. To be sure, church leaders, including those who have position, positioned themselves as what we might call conservative culture warriors on other issues, have nevertheless embraced the phrase Black Lives Matter and encouraged other Catholics to do likewise. For example, Baltimore Archbishop William Lurie, a white man, who infamously champ championed the Anti-Affordable Care Act movement during the Obama administration, nevertheless wrote a compelling article just this year about how the Black Lives Matter movement aligns very well with Catholic social teaching. He writes that the words Black Lives Matter should resonate with us Catholics and indeed with all those who embrace the principles of Catholic social teaching. He goes on, he says, more than that, these words should spur us on to action. By its nature, the church's social teaching is not a mere statement of principle or policy, but, a, but more a summons to heal the wounds of sin and division and to take up anew the task of building a society that is a civilization of truth and love. With the church's social teaching as our guide, let us, as a Catholic community, the Archbishop says, build bridges of understanding so that we can say in wisdom, truth, and love that Black lives matter. In many ways, the relatively new expression Black Lives Matter is the latest embodiment of a centuries-old quest to address the evils of systemic racism and the culture of white supremacy in the United States. To proclaim Black Lives Matter is to name a painful truth. It is not a statement of novelty, as if to suggest that, well, up until now it didn't count, but now Black Lives Matter. Rather, it's an uncovering of the sinful status quo of our society and church that has for centuries said one thing, for instance, that all men and women are created equal and that each person is created in the image and likeness of God, respectively society and the church. Nevertheless, both in practice have acted with flagrant disregard for the freedom, safety, life, and flourishing of black and brown people. What began in this country with indigenous genocide by European colonists, continued with chattel slavery, and then continued as reactionary Jim Crow era segregation and terror, and then continued into our own time with mass incarceration, police brutality, and voter suppression. 
To proclaim Black Lives Matter is to draw attention to the hypocrisy of white Christians and secular citizens alike who talk the talk of American inclusivity and freedom, but walk the walk of discrimination, subjugation, and disenfranchisement. But activists of color and white allies alike assert when they protest, speak, write, and educate others under the banner of Black Lives Matter is the continuation of a struggle for racial justice that dates back to before the establishment of any such country known as the United States. And for this reason, sadly, many of the basic demands and legitimate critiques of our social and ecclesial, that is church systems, structures, and institutions today, echo those expressed during the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. In fact, the broad Black Lives Matter movement is in many ways the rightful heir of the legacies of Rosa Parks, Stokely Carmichael, Martin Luther King Jr., Representative John Lewis, Angela Davis, Malcolm X, and so many, many others. Because the current movement for racial justice is a continuation and development of the earlier civil rights movement, which has never ended, which, with, which the white Catholic priest and Trappist monk Thomas Merton wrote about in that time, in the 50s, in the 60s, and did so with such stunning insight. There continues to be so much that we can learn from Merton, particularly for those of us like me, who are white Catholics or white Christians or just white people in the US, seeking to understand better the faith we profess in the God of justice and peace. So let me turn now to talk about Thomas Merton and his writings on racial justice. And while there are surely other areas that could be discussed, I really wanna highlight three notable dimensions of Merton's anti-racist writings that reveal a distinctly prophetic character. First, he recognized and called out the reality of systemic or structural racism beyond the particularity of individual and overt racist acts. Second, he identified the anti-Black racist culture embedded in American Christian communities, including the Catholic Church. And third, he acknowledged white complicity in the establishment and perpetuation of systemic and institutional racism, which led him to proclaim that racism is a white problem. So first, the reality of systemic racism. Perhaps the best known and well-read of Burton's anti-racist writings is his essay titled, Letters to a White Liberal. He wrote this in 1963 and did so inspired and in an effort to respond to Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous letter from Birmingham jail. This lengthy reflection on the nature of anti-Black racism in the US is presented as Merton's attempt to listen and to process and to integrate what he was hearing and reading about the quest for racial justice, especially from perspectives of Black authors and civil rights leaders. He wanted to take Martin Luther King seriously and take and embrace his challenge. In the conclusion of the essay, Merton explains that his aim in writing this 70 plus page essay was introspective as, as much as it was ex, you know, an exhortation, stating plainly that what is necessary for white people is that they actually listen to their black sisters and brothers. He writes, this is the message which the Negro is trying to give white America. I have spelled it out for myself, subject to correction, in order to see whether a white man is even capable of grasping the words, let alone believing them. What Merton is doing here is modeling a mode of self-education, of awakening to the reality of racial justice that's blocked over by the performance of whiteness, what it means to be a white person in a culture in a context like the US. White people like him, like me, like so many of us here this evening, have to deliberately want to know, have to deliberately open ourselves to the message and experience and instruction of those disadvantaged by the same unjust system that accrues unearned benefits and privileges to white people. Merton explains, and I quote, for the rest of you, you have Moses and the prophets, Martin Luther King, James Baldwin, and others. Read them and see for yourself what they are saying. So what are the modern anti-racist Moses and the prophets saying to white people? Well, from Merton's perspective, part of their admonition is focused on the pervasiveness of systemic racism. As Merton explains in his preface to the French translation of part of this essay, this reality, systemic racism, all too often is unacknowledged by whites and is something 
um, that is governed by emotions and the unconscious. It's something that is beneath at times the surface, but always already operating. Merton says the following, he explains, American racism has something of the character of an ineradicable and axiomatic conviction, which is accepted as the basis for an entire outlook on life and becomes the logical presupposition for inhuman conclusions. The chief of these is the justification of any form of violence, hatred, and cruelty, end quote. Merton regularly makes the important distinction between individual acts of racist animus or hatred on the one hand, and the reality of systemic racism, which is much larger on the other. He describes the inherently unjust laws and structures that ground so much of American society. For example, in an essay written in the fall of 1967, Merton observed the following, he says, it is pointless to say that the laws guarantee the Negro all the same rights as white people. We know that the laws are not enforced and the Negro is often denied his obvious rights, but also economically speaking, the Negro remains in the same position as he was before, perhaps worse. He is convinced that there is no real place for him in our established society, except the very secondary place which we whites will give him. It is a psychological impossibility for most white Americans really to accept a Negro as an equal in every respect, and the violent struggle against open, open housing has proved it." End quote. Anticipating those whites who would protest the reality of structural and institutional racism by claiming that progress has been made and that there are now clear laws to protect people of color from unfair treatment, Merton responds, he says, and I quote, you will point to the Supreme Court decisions that have upheld Negro rights to education in integrated colleges and schools. It seems to me that our motives are judged by the real fruit of our decisions. What have we done? And to this, his own question, he responds and he says, we have been willing to grant the Negro rights on paper, even in the South, but the laws have been framed in such a way that in every case their execution has depended on the good will of white society and the white man has not failed when left to, to himself to block, obstruct, or simply forget the necessary action without which the rights of the Negro cannot be enjoyed in fact. And this, this is exactly what Black Lives Matter activists seek to draw greater public attention to. Merton recognized that a structurally racist society such as the United States operates in an inherently unjust and violent manner, though to those in positions of power or dominance, which usually are white people in general and white men in particular, the system appears orderly, sensible, and even just. In an article that he titled Toward a Theology of Resistance, Merton points to how this dynamic plays out within the American context in which the white majority views crime or violence in communities of color, communities segregated by unjust laws and practices of a racist society. And Merton looks at this situation, this phenomenon, he says the following, and I quote, but it must be remembered that the crime that breaks out of the ghetto is, the, is only the fruit of a greater and more pervasive violence, the injustice which forces people to live in the ghetto in the first place. The problem of violence then is not a problem of a few rioters and rebels, but the problem of a whole social structure which is outwardly ordered and respectable and inwardly ridden by psychopathic obsessions and delusions. For Merton, this phenomenon of systemic racism as part and parcel of American culture is not limited to the sphere of civil politics or social norms, but it also implicates the Catholic Church and Christianity more broadly especially here in the United States. And so let me turn now to that second point, racism in American Christianity. Debunking the myth that racism exists only in the American South, Merton notes in a 1965 article titled Religion and Race in the United States, that African Americans in the North, in the Northern parts, the Northern states, are quite aware of the deeply embedded institutional racism of Christianity in this country. He writes, quote, the Northern Negro is, generally speaking, disillusioned with the churches and with the Christian preaching of moderation and nonviolence. His feeling is that the churches are part of the establishment, which in fact they are. They support the power structure and therefore he believes, quote, 
keep the Negro deluded and passive, preventing him from fighting for his rights, end quote. And recognizing, as he does, that the problem of American racism turned out to be far deeper, far more stubborn, infinitely more complex than most whites would care to admit, this raises urgent and perennial concerns for the church. Merton recognized the choice placed before Christians in general and Christian leaders in particular. He writes, and I quote, the American racial crisis, which grows more serious every day, offers the American Christian a chance to face reality about himself and recover his fidelity to Christian truth, not merely in institutional loyalties and doctrinal orthodoxies, but in recanting a more basic heresy, the loss of that Christian sense which sees other, man, other men and women as Christ and treats them as Christ, end quote. Merton makes clear that the consequences of racial injustice within the church is also a white problem and one that requires choosing to acknowledge this reality and accept the conversion necessary uh, to make some radical changes from the status quo. He addresses directly his fellow white Christians and he says the following. Merton writes, in the American crisis, the Christian faces a typical choice. The choice is not interior and secret, but public, political, and social. He is perhaps not used to regarding his crucial choices in the light of politics. He can now either find security and order by falling back on antique and basically feudal or perhaps fascist conceptions, or go forward into the unknown future, identifying himself with the forces that will inevitably create a new society. The choice is between safety based on negation of the new and reaffirming the familiar or the creative risk of love and grace in new and untried solutions, which, never, which, which justice nevertheless demands, end quote. This focus on the choice at hand impugns the collective innocence of white Christians and of the church in general. Racism is a white problem within American Christianity because as with the broader American context, the structures, the institutions, the norms, the loci of power are created and too often held by whites. And nothing will change until white people take responsibility and dare to risk the culture and society uh, that, which, which is necessary and change is necessary. And this brings us to the third prophetic point of Merton's writings, the white complicity and racism that, that arises from uh, the context in which we find ourselves and that ultimately, as Merton says, is a white problem. The most notably prophetic dimension, I think, of Merton's writings on race is his recognition of white complicity and the need for white people to acknowledge that the same situation that oppresses people of color works to their advantage and benefit. Again, returning to his letters to a white liberal, Merton explains why the truth of systemic racism is so threatening for most whites to acknowledge. He says, here is why it is a source of uneasiness and fear, for, uh, fear to all white men who are attached to their security. If they are forced to listen to what the Negro is trying to say, then whites may have to admit that their prosperity is rooted to some extent in injustice and in sin. And in consequence, this might lead to a complete re-examination of the political motives behind all our current policies, domestic and foreign, with the possible admission that we are wrong." End quote. Earlier in the same essay, he acknowledges that the laws and social norms of our American society are deeply racist, which simultaneously oppresses some and advantages others. He says, if we, have, if we have got to the point where the laws are frequently, if not commonly framed in such a way that they can be easily evaded by a privileged group, then the very structure of our society comes into question, end quote. And again, this is Another theme, a key theme that the Black Lives Matter movement is attempting to draw attention to, calling us to see as a society and furthermore as a church. I can't help but think just about what's happening and has happened in recent weeks, just a few, uh, you know, an hour, two hours north of where I'm sitting right now in Kenosha, Wisconsin, just over the border with Illinois. And there's no starker illustration of Merton's point about the way in which laws are framed and then easily evaded by privileged groups than by seeing the way that the Kenosha police re reacted to Jacob Blake and shooting an unarmed black man seven times in the back and then letting a man, a young man, a 17-year-old boy with an assault rifle 
walk right past them after murdering two people and shooting a third. This is not an abstract idea Merton is talking about. Merton was to some extent aware of how whiteness is performed in a structurally racist society such that generally unbeknownst to the individual, white people like me, like many of us this evening on this call, actively participate in, we reinscribe and therefore perpetuate the racist systems that are sinful and oppressive. In a lengthy passage that he added as an appendix to an essay titled, The Hot Summer of 67, Merton says the following, and I wanna quote it in full. He says, there is however such a thing as collective responsibility and collective guilt. This is not quite the same as personal responsibility and personal guilt, because it does not usually follow from a direct, fully conscious act of choice. Few of us have actively and consciously chosen to oppress and mistreat the Negro, Merton says, and he goes on. But nevertheless, we have all more or less acquiesced in and consented to a state of affairs in which the Negro is treated unjustly and in which his unjust treatment is directly or indirectly to the advantage of people like ourselves, people with whom we agree and collaborate, people with whom we are in fact identified. So that even if in theory, the white man may believe himself well disposed toward the Negro, and never gets into a bind in which he proves himself otherwise, we all collectively contribute to a situation in which the Negro has to live and act as our inferior. He, he concludes here, he says, I am personally convinced that most white people who think of themselves as very, quote, fair to the Negro show by way they imagine themselves fair that they consider the Negro an inferior type of human being, a sort of, quote, minor, and in their, quote, fairness consists in giving him certain benefits provided he, quote, keeps in his place, the place they have allocated to him as an inferior. Merton says, I would like to say that this state of mind is itself an act of inhumanity and injustice against the Negro. It is in fact at the root of the trouble with the Negro so that anyone who upholds such opinions, even in the best of faith, is contributing actively to the violence of the present situation, whether he or she realizes it or not, end quote. Merton is addressing the subtle and destructive ways that racism operates in the daily lives of white women and men. Part of that complicity manifests itself in the presumption that the white experience is normative and not just normative, but actually superior or preferable or the standard by which to evaluate everything else. Merton writes, and I quote, in simple terms, I would say that the message black people want whites to hear is this, white society has sinned in many ways. It has betrayed Christ by its injustices to races it considers inferior and to countries which it colonized. In particular, it has sinned against Christ in its lamentable injustices and cruelties to the Negro, end quote. Elsewhere, Merton, um, ref Merton reflects on the consequences of a white supremacist society such as our own, noting that it's not always overt violence or you know, clear discriminatory legislation as explicit as found in the Jim Crow South, but there are unexamined ways whites benefit financially and politically by the exploitation of persons of color. Merton realized with prophetic clarity that racism in the United States is in fact a white problem, which led him to a state, uh, led him, excuse me, to state a sense of cautious hope that our, si our society and our church could be different, but it's up to white people. As Father Brian Massengale has often said in interviews and in writings, if racism were left only up to people of color to be solved, it would have been solved 400 years ago. Merton says and explains this, he says, quote, as long as white society persists in clinging to its present condition and to its own image of itself as the only acceptable reality, then the problem will remain without reasonable solution and there will inevitably be violence, end quote. I can't help but think of the ways in which Merton and his contemporary, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about how the violence that is you know, never to be celebrated, never to be encouraged, but nevertheless, Merton says here, inevitable, and that Martin Luther King calls that riots and violence as the voices of the unheard, that this is the natural outgrowth when people in control and power and in a society and in church, in a church like ours, white people don't listen. <laughs>
Merton knew that the sickness of systemic racism was so pervasive, such an ideological cancer that had metastasized in all parts of American society, that radical change was necessary. But that change had to begin with white people. For as long as white women and men shirked the obligation to recognize the unjust system, to deny its reality, to pretend it's not real, to look the other way, to dismiss it, or to demonize it, or to claim that Black Lives Matter movements and protests are the real, quote, domestic terrorism, another lie, then it will continue unimpeded to benefit white people and subjugate people of color. So let me close. While there is so much more to say about the importance and inspiration of the Black Lives Matter movement and the writings and legacy of Thomas Merton, I wanna close my presentation with an observation about Merton's insights from more than half a century ago. Namely, I believe Merton models for other white Christians what it means to risk the discomfort that comes with facing hard truths about reality. It requires of us a spirituality of ongoing conversion that is humble enough to acknowledge that what white Christians like him and like me and like many of you have been told is true or led to believe is true or presumed to be true about our collective history and the order of things is patently false. Furthermore, that falsehood is not just a matter of inaccurate facts, but it exists to reinforce a structure and, and institutions that advantage white people and harm people of color. Merton understood that racism is more than discrete acts of bad individuals, but that its pervasiveness in the American context text affects everybody, including through the complicity of white people and the inaction and half measures of the church. Today, the Black Lives Matter movement calls all of us white folk to see the real signs of our times and through interpreting them according to the gospel to work for racial justice and strive to be better anti-racist allies. With Merton as one among many formidable guides, may we move from willful ignorance to informed discernment, from unwitting complicity to deliberate action, and from passive faith to agents of authentic Christian discipleship working on behalf of genuine peace and justice, no matter the discomfort, the challenge, or the cost. So thank you for uh, being here this evening and thank you for listening to my prepared remarks. Thank you very much, Dan, for those insightful thoughts and insights from Merton and from yourself. We have some questions which have come in. Um, the one I'd like to start with is, what would Thomas Merton say today how to stop our white passivity, whether we intend it or not? So I, I need to, to begin with, with a note of caution that uh, last I checked, I am not a psychic or a medium, so I can't channel uh, the spirit of, of Thomas Merton, uh, being a little bit tongue in cheek there. Um, but I just say that as a disclaimer, because as a matter of historical kind of analysis, I don't 100% know. People ask me that all the time about St. Francis of Assisi, too. Like, what would St. Francis think of X, Y, or Z? And uh, I always invoke one of my colleagues, uh, a Franciscan friar and, and, and historian, who says, well, first of all, if Francis of Assisi were alive today, he'd be very confused. Um, so, you know, I'm not entirely sure, except to say that I think a lot of what he was saying to both himself as he was being introspective and in, in trying to take seriously the challenge and witness and wisdom and insight of people like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and James Baldwin and others, um, as well as what he was saying to his fellow quote unquote white liberals. By that he means white women and men, oftentimes women and men of faith, who are not liberal necessarily in a political sense, but understood themselves as allies or supporters of the civil rights movement. And, and one of the things that Merton lays out there is this taking the responsibility, turning the lens back around on oneself. And so I think, you know, that's the starting point is for white people in particular, it's, it's, uh, it's a couple things. It's, it's analyzing, it's reflecting, it's learning, but it's also a matter of hearing, right, and believing. Um, I think part of the problem that we see today with a lot of inaction that's made worse, even maybe more difficult than in Merton's time, is the siloing of information that we have, the siloing of our news, where people can live in these echo chambers where their preconceived notions and presumptions are reaffirmed and, and 
and held up as, as universal and true. So I think one of the things that Merton models for us is being open to the ways things are, you know, for other people, particularly for the people who uh, suffer most from the experiences of uh, systemic racism, you know, this, this unjust uh, systems, institutions, structures in which we find ourselves. So I think that's the starting point. And quite frankly, I think Merton, it, he says it so well at the end of his letters to a white liberal, he says, you go read these African-American writers, you go listen to the activists and the scholars and, and the people who are leading the cause for you know, equality, equity, justice, you know, and, and reform. Um, that's how it begins. So I think, I think looking to Merton as a model, reading him to see how he's thinking through some of this and allowing it to really change him and how his own thinking develops over time is very insightful. I think that's, a, that's kind of what he lays out for us today. Thank you. Another question. Do you have any advice for parishioners who would like to start a racial justice group or discussion group, but the priest has no interest in this? Oh, so that's, that's a couple questions, isn't it, really? So, um, the, if I may, I, I'm, I'm, I'm processing the question because I think what's, if I understand the question correctly, what's really being asked is how does one begin this sort of work of education and learning and study um, in the process of ongoing conversion into action, right? And in, into solidarity and then to allyship when uh, in your local parish community, there's resistance. I mean, I, I'll say simply this, that you, know, you don't have to look to the priest or the pastor for everything. Um, and, and what I mean by that is the Second Vatican Council makes clear that all the baptized are equally dignified, have equal kind of Christian standing to every other a baptized Christian, whether the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, or the most newly baptized baby and everybody in between, we're all equally Christian. We're all equally called to holiness and called to be disciples of Christ. So, you know, maybe the obstacles that that poses um, when the pastor is resistant is that, you know, he may not sanction the meeting to take place on parish grounds or under the auspices of the parish itself and, and, and so forth. But you know, I think one of the great silver linings of the horrible global pandemic we're experiencing now is that we can do programming like this. I mean, maybe find somebody in your parish community who has a Zoom account who's interested in this and form organic communities. Um, I, I also encourage people to take advantage of resources that are available and, and Googling Black Lives Matter local chapters, um, reading resources. Um, I, I think the questioner was mentioned a, a Catholic parish. I highly recommend Father Brian Massengale's book, uh, Racial Justice in the Catholic Church. Um, and, and there are many, many other resources too, including Merton's writings. Um, but I think to feel empowered to embrace your baptismal vocation, to do it yourself is, is the only way, quite frankly, because there will be places and there will be pastors sometimes out of malice, sometimes out of ignorance, sometimes out of exhaustion. You know, they've got too much going on uh, for them to take the lead. So I strongly encourage you, I wanna support you in that um, and, and encourage you to, to take the lead. So don't wait for him, do it, just get started. There you go, pretty clear answer. In that same vein about finding information to allay some ignorance, do you have any suggestions where we might find the true mission of Black Lives Matter if some of the websites we might chase, you know, take us down the wrong hole or are false. So in, any guidance there in terms of maybe finding out more about that movement? Yeah, I, 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 you know, that's why I wanted to spend that time in the beginning of my presentation highlighting exactly that point. You know, I, I quoted, there's a great book. It's, it's a bit of an academic book. It's a, it's a book by a historian named uh, Christopher LeBron that came out, I think in 2017 or 2018 the title of which is The Making of Black Lives Matter. And it's, it's about the history of the idea. And he, he does such a tremendous job, not only outlining some of those historical data points that I shared, you know, the three women of color who, who really spontaneously um, found themselves on social media, seeking community, seeking solidarity, seeking energy and action in response to the hor horrifying uh, murder of Trayvon Martin and then the acquittal of the man who murdered him. 
one of the things that he points out very clearly is that despite a website that has the domain Black Lives Matter dot org or what what have you or other such websites or other such communities the nature of the movement is not centrally located so the question is a little bit and I'm, I'm sorry I'm being a bit wordy here the question is based on a premise that is untrue so the premise is that there's one sort of singular you know uh, charter or constitution that describes Black Lives Matter as an LLC or a corporation or a church or organization or a 501c3 and one of the things LeBron points out and that the three women of color who who launched this and others who who invoke the name Black Lives Matter, including Archbishop Lori in Baltimore point out is that this is not the domain. It is not a phrase limited to one organization, to one group. So again, long-windedly, I would say there is no such singular list of things. What is the basic point of the slogan Black Lives Matter? It's to draw attention to the fact that such a statement has to be said at all. You know, you'll hear sometimes people chime back, well, you know, Catholics are pro-life or shouldn't all lives matter? And, and the answer is simply yes, but if all lives matter, there'd be no need to say it. And the truth is, you know, again, I, I think of recently the horrific events unfolding in Kenosha, Wisconsin, or closer to my own hometown and where one of my brothers and his family lives. And I know I saw some names I recognized in our session right now there in Rochester, New York, and we're with you in solidarity and in prayer. As, as the city grapples with the fact that the treatment of men and women of color reflect policies, practices, worldviews that say Black lives do not matter. And I recommend to everybody, if you haven't and you don't know much about the story of Daniel Prude, who was killed in uh, police custody in Rochester, New York earlier this spring, uh, and there are state uh, attorney general investigation right now into the possibility of a cover-up about that whole episode and that murder, I encourage you to listen to the New York Times podcast, The Daily, from this morning, and that will help explain uh, some of what's going on there. But further, to my point, will help illustrate the fact that you can't know the facts and, and the narrative and what preceded earlier in March that ended up in the death of a man who was not well mentally, who posed no immediate threat to anybody, who needed assistance, care, love, and support, as the mayor of Rochester said in one of her, her uh, uh, press uh, meetings, her press uh, interviews. What happened instead is the police treated him as if his life did not matter, and the consequence was he died. The consequence was another person's life was ended. And the litany that we prayed in trying to invoke just a few of the many hundreds and thousands and millions of unnamed people going back for centuries on this continent, women and men and children of color who've been treated like their lives do not matter. That's what the slogan means. So when we ask, what is it about? It's, that's the starting point. And the implications of that invocation are manifold. So they can't be contained in one you know, website. It can't be contained in one person's sort of proclamation. It's something far deeper. And I think that's the power of the statement. That's why even people like Archbishop Lori, who is not known, he's not a kind of progressive left-wing liberal. He's somebody, as I mentioned, who was very much against the Affordable Care Act and against President Obama's administration and some of their policies and so forth. Yet he can say Catholic social teaching compels us to embrace this movement, to work on behalf of this movement, because what it taps into is something so profound so important, so urgent, that there's no other choice for people of goodwill than to respond to it. So that's my response. It's very long-winded again. I, it's a consequence, it's a, a side effect of being a professor. I talk too much. But um, you know, I, I think it's a fair question in my sense is that you know, as the questioner poses it, and many of us on, on this call this evening are familiar with family members and friends and, and par parishioners and others who will hear things and that have cast doubt in their minds about Black Lives Matter as if it were some kind of singular organization or a kind of conspiratorial cover or something. And I think you really have to ground yourself in, in the truth of what's being pointed to there. Um, and that is the profound work that needs to be done and the urgency uh, that, that we must take.
Thanks. And in, in that long answer, at least you answered one other question we had about negotiating between those who want to say Black Lives Matter and those who want to just simply say All Lives Matter. And how does one deal with that? Yeah. This one's a little different uh, angle. We're all aware that uh, the issue of women's inequality is very much a part of the life of too many churches, maybe a part of the white, ris white racism issue. And the question was simply asked this way, isn't systemic racism a white man's problem because of the power issue? That's a great question. Um, you know, my students, uh, if there are any uh, watching this evening will be familiar with this, they know already that one of my favorite German words is the word jein, which is a combination of ja and nein in German, yes and no. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a yes and no together, a, a both and. So, you know, is it a white man's problem? Yes and no. Um, yes, that white men, you know, if we were to reflect a, a kind of, as, as I think Isabel Wilkerson, and here's a resource that I, I can't recommend highly enough, Isabel Wilkerson's recent book called Cast, The Origin of Our Discontents, is, is a powerful and incredibly compelling study of basically the his history and development and persistence and transformation of racism uh, in, in the United States over the course of 400 plus years. And she looks at uh, India, she looks at the Third Reich the, of Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s, and she looks at the United States. And she talks about uh, a hierarchical structure, a stratification of, of people based on power and privilege and access and so forth. And, and she talks about, you know, in the United States, it's based on race, right? So you have whites who are at the top of the pyramid, as it were, of the power pyramid, socially in this caste system. They're the dominant caste. Uh, African-Americans, those of African descent, are, are the subordinated caste at the very bottom of the pyramid. And then there's a stratification of various other people of color, Native Americans, people of Asian descent, Latinos, Latinx folks, and so forth. And why I'm bringing that up is because I, I don't think it's as simple as saying um, yes or no to this, because white women have maybe not as much power as white men in our racist patriarchal society, which is absolutely correct. You're 100% right to point that out, and it is important, and it is present and at times exacerbated in religious communities and churches, for sure. But I think all one has to do is go back to Memorial Day morning in Central Park in New York City and learn about or recall the episode of Amy Cooper with her unleashed dog and the threat and deployment of her white power, her white privilege as a woman, particularly with the way she deployed what, what we might call white women's tears to elicit support from authorities, including police officers, who have, as we've seen, you know, again, over the decades and centuries, have the ability to execute, to murder people of color uh, with, with relative impunity. That's a great example of, some, of, of, of white women deploying racialized power in this context. Um, it's not the only example. There could be other examples. And I also recommend to you, there's a whole chapter toward the end of Robin DiAngelo's recent book um, came out two years ago and is again back on, I think on a best-selling list um, called White Fragility. And she has a chapter there with that very title, uh, White Women's Tears. And she herself, a white woman um, and an anti-racist activist talks about the ways in which gender and race play into white supremacy, white privilege, and systemic racism, right, and, and racial subjugation and, and, and dominance. So um, I'm not sure if I answered that question or if that really gets at what the questioner was referring to, um, but I would say that, you know, insofar as we're talking about power, yes, when you combine the, the kind of intersecting identities of maleness in a patriarchal society and whiteness in a racist society, white men are at the top. That includes people like me. And to make it, to make it even clearer, in the Catholic Church, I'm an ordained priest. I'm a, I'm a cleric. I, I have clerical power, you know, and that's oftentimes opposed in binary ways to the laity, right? That's another issue altogether. Um, and so they compound, just like the inverse is true or the, or the complement is true, that intersecting identities can compound in terms of oppression. So if you are a black woman 
uh, who's queer, right, who might be a black lesbian woman, you have so many intersecting, you know, forms of oppression, just like uh, a white, straight, cisgendered male would benefit from the same inequality, from the same um, injustice, uh, system of injustice. So there's more to say on that, and there's a lot of great work out there, but I hope the resources I named, uh, Isabel Wilkerson's brilliant book, Robin DiAngelo's excellent book, are, are good places to, to consult. Thanks, Dan. I'm glad you mentioned the Wilkerson book, Cast. It's, it is a wonderful resource for those of us who want to learn more. I like this question. Any reflection on John Lewis as an influence on Merton, the story of him crossing the bridge at Selma with two books in his backpack, one of which is a Merton book? Yeah, I'm so glad that came up. Somebody had also uh, sent a question in advance about that. And so I'd been thinking about it. And it's something I've been thinking about um, ever since Congressman Lewis's uh, death earlier this summer and his very beautiful, very powerful uh, memorial service. Um, so what we know, and this is something that Representative Lewis mentioned uh, in response to Pope Francis's 2015 address, uh, actually five years ago this month before Congress, where Congressman Lewis was in, in the Capitol listening to Pope Francis and he, his office released a statement about his own reflections on how powerful that experience was to hear the Holy Father talk about Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., Thomas Merton, and Dorothy Day. And, and part of that was so moving to him because he identified obviously Martin Luther King with whom as a younger man, a much younger man, he was um, a civil rights activist and, and a, a mentee of Dr. King and, and marched with Martin Luther King, uh, studied at his feet and beside him um, in, in a leadership role. He was in, in 1965, John Lewis that is, was the chairman of the, the student, um, uh, what's called the Student Nonviolent uh, Coordination Committee, uh, SNCC as it's called sometimes. And uh, he, so he was very involved with civil rights work. He mentions in that press release after listening to Pope Francis that he had two books with him in his knapsack when he uh, crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge on that famous Bloody Sunday in Selma. Uh, and he mentions, you know, one is a book by Richard Hofstander called The American Political Tradition, and another he never mentions the name of. He says, an, in a book by Thomas Merton, because he assumed he'd be in jail or be processed and have time to read, you know, need something to entertain himself. Well, uh, former President Bill Clinton at his, at, at Congressman Lewis's funeral, gave a eulogy where he named a book of Merton's and said that he had Seven Story Mountain with him. That has bothered me for the last month and a half because I don't think it was Seven Story Mountain. And I've been trying to figure out exactly what, what book John Lewis had with him. Um, and as best I can tell, it actually was Seeds of Destruction, not Seven Story Mountain. The reason that I believe it's Seeds of Destruction, which was published in November of 1964, is that in an address that John Lewis gave as the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee to his fellow staff members, um, which has been preserved, he quotes, in fact, I have it right here. He says, Father Thomas Merton raises this question in his book, Seeds of Destruction. Is it possible for Negroes and whites in this country to engage in a certain political experiment such as the world has never yet witnessed and in which the first condition would be that whites consent to let Negroes run their own revolution, giving them the necessary support and being alarmed at some of the sacrifices and difficulties this would involve? And here, John, young John Lewis is, is referencing a book that's only been out for two months. And that within weeks, you know, that's February of 1965, March 7th, 1965 is that Selma March. I believe that, that John Lewis had that book, Seeds of Destruction, with him in his backpack. Why is that significant? Because Merton, as I was quoting from it earlier today, that, that long essay, Letters to a White Liberal, is the biggest portion of that book, Seeds of Destruction. So I believe that Merton had an influence on John Lewis. And we know for a fact that Merton was was very well respected among a number of civil rights leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr., with whom um, they were supposed to meet. In fact, they were supposed to meet in April of 1968 for a retreat that mutual friends, um, John and June Jungblatt uh, from Atlanta, Georgia, had arranged. They were mutual friends of Merton's and of Martin Luther King's. And King had heard of Merton and had read his writings and was planning to make a private retreat with Merton 
at the Abbey of Gethsemane, but because of the sanitation workers strike in Memphis and, and his desire to go and support them, which we know ended so tragically with his assassination, that was rescheduled, was postponed and ultimately never happened. I bring that up because I, I, now with all three of those men I've just mentioned being deceased, we don't really know. It's hard to trace the lines, but I can say generally speaking that these writings that I was referencing tonight, as well as others of Merton and Merton's other writings, not just on racial justice, but on spirituality, on politics, on nonviolence, on the Vietnam War, on the Cold War, on a lot of social issues that Merton was writing about from his hermitage, from the Abbey of Gethsemane in rural Kentucky, was being read and discussed and informed a lot of the civil rights movement, uh, at least at the philosophical and spiritual level, a lot of their thinking and organizing. So, so there is certainly a connection there. I don't think, you know, it's, not, it's just for a lack of opportunity. Merton dies in December 1968. He never had a chance to meet Martin Luther King, and he also didn't have a chance to meet John Lewis. Um, and so it, I don't, it's harder to say the other way, and I think that's how the question was phrased. Did John Lewis inform Merton anyway? I don't think, sadly, he had the opportunity to. Um, but I, God, I would love, and maybe in the next life, we'll have an opportunity to have uh, maybe not Zoom, maybe we could all be in some kind of heavenly auditorium where we can listen to Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Thomas Merton and John Lewis all talk. That would be amazing. As you referenced uh, those two folks in Atlanta, they happen to be Quakers and that anticipates That's right. the next yeah. qu question is, um, as it was in the 60s, um, I think at the bridge, Heschel was there as well, a wonderful Jewish scholar. Um, how do you see the whole interfaith ecumenical uh, possibilities in working with the Black Lives Matter, the African American churches? So the kind of ecumenical uh, interfaith possibilities in uh, bringing a world that we would all like to see. Yeah, I think it's absolutely essential. Um, but you know, I think I think there are a couple things that that Merton is very. Um, very instructive in, in helping us to think about how a process of ecumenism, which is something that was near and dear again to Merton's own heart and his own writings and his own um, correspondence, uh, as well as his own kind of leading retreats and so forth. One of the things that Merton came to realize, and this is what's very striking, is he's somebody who's a cloistered monk. He was living on the edge of society and the edge of the church, as it were, and yet he was able, through a spiritual conversion, an ongoing conversion, to be able to actually listen to what his sisters and brothers of color, you know, experiencing the injustices, uh, leading the civil rights movement, calling for justice and peace, what they were saying. And one of the things that he tells his fellow white Christians, and I think this is a starting point for the ecumenical movement too, is that for those churches or congregations that are predominantly white, this is a time to be quiet. <laughs> you know, I think about the, the famous musical uh, from Lin-Manuel Miranda, you know, Hamilton, there's a great exchange between Aaron Burr, who, spoiler alert, is the antagonist, spoiler alert, he, he, he kills uh, Alexander Hamilton. Um, but early on, you know, he gives this kind of unsolicited advice to the young Alexander Hamilton, and he says, talk less, smile more. And that point talk less is really important because I think white people, myself included, we're socialized, um, particularly white religious leaders, we're used to being in front of a congregation or used to being the chairs of committees or organizing groups and so forth. And there are ways in which our efforts to help can sometimes be inhibiting or prohibitive. And one of the things that Merton points out is that, you know, in order this is one of his big critiques of white Northern religious leaders, including, you know, not by name, but including people like Martin Marty, the great Protestant historian, and Abraham Heschel, um, the great rabbi and scholar, and others who came down from the North to, to march with King and others and meant well. One of the things that Merton was able to see and critique that was not well received at the time by these folks was what are your interior motives? And there requires a lot of introspection, discernment, and evaluation because is there a rush to go down to be a part of a movement in order to unwittingly or maybe intentionally even control the movement or to have control or to have your voice take priority? 
And, and, and these are the kind of questions that I think are cautions that Merton speaks over the course of time. Now, he's the first to say, you know, white people have to do something and Christians have to do something and white Christians especially have to do something. But I think um, there's also a note about taking the lead from our sisters and brothers of color, particularly those in the black uh, Christian tradition, you know, the Southern Baptists, black Catholics, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, people of color from all different denominations and see what, what we as white Christians can do to be better allies. And that begins with the, the learning and the listening rather than the kind of uh, the leading and the saying. So I think that's all I'll say at this point. Um, but I think it's absolutely essential. It's, it's, a, it's, it's absolutely essential. Thank you. I know we're beginning to head towards the end of this session. I know, also know that you received some questions from people before the, the, uh, this evening even started. Is there one of those that you would like to bring up to us and, and share with us? Well, you know, uh, I, the only one that I had on the top of my head, and I apologize to the folks who very generously sent those questions in advance, that was the one that I had flagged to make sure that, um, uh, to, to make sure to talk about John Lewis and, and that connection. So I'm afraid I, I, I'm drawing a blank right now on what the, uh, the others were, and I apologize. Thank you again for, for the folks who reached out. I, I don't know, Ellen, if, if there's another one you might have. To Let me ask up. one more, and this can be uh, the last one from, from me. You mentioned at the outset, and you did pursue it, linking systemic racism and privilege. Are those two always linked, or were they just linked for you tonight in, in a special part of what you were doing tonight? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so from Mer I'll, I'll speak from Merton's perspective, and then what scholars of, of race and racial justice uh, have, have pointed out in the centuries between Merton's own observations and writings and in our own time up until our time, which is, is, is simply, yes, they are always linked. Um, but, but they, you know, because what we're talking about on the one hand is, uh, is a system, is, is a way of being in the world that orders not just perspectives and, and, and uh, kind of assumptions and behaviors, but also informs things like laws and politics, policies, our institutions, our structures, hiring practices, uh, the justice system, incarceration practices, and so on and so on and so on. And, and if you pick any one of those various sub-themes, we might say, or kind of social issues, or even church issues, right, you can, you can look at it from both sides of the coin of systemic racial injustice. On one side, it's racial oppression, uh, what we might call for simplicity's sake, racism. And on the other side, you see the advantage that those in what Wilkerson calls the dominant caste benefit from, right? So that would be the, the, the white privilege side of things. Um, the problem is the system itself, the, the kind of insidiousness of it, is that those who benefit from the system are at the same time, we might say, shielded from recognition of their own benefit. And you'll hear this a lot, um, particularly from white folks who, uh, who will say, well, you know, I recognize, you know, I see these videos of unarmed African Americans being killed by police and, and that's wrong and I recognize the injustice there or I recognize when, when the KKK has a rally and these sorts of things, I recognize that's very clear to me but I, I, I don't see what you mean when you talk about how I'm advantaged by the system. What are you talking about? I'm struggling to make ends meet. I've just been furloughed during the pandemic. I, you know, I, I had a hard time in school, what have you. I, I don't seem to be reaping these magical benefits that seem to be presented. And you know, I'm using that as kind of an extreme illustration, but it's, it's tricky because you have to dive a little bit deeper beneath the surface to start to see it. And once you start to see it, and Merton recognized this as well, you can't help but see it everywhere. So I'll give you one example. I live in Chicago, and I think about this often. Um, I haven't been to downtown Chicago in a long time now because of the pandemic. I've been staying mostly in, in the neighborhood where I live on the south side. But when I used to go down there more regularly, I would think about um, some of the stores on the Magnificent Mile, some of you know it who know Chicago well, and you think about these really nice uh, stores, and I think of like Macy's, which is like, it's like Macy's in New York City. It's many, many stories. It's, it's a couple city blocks. And the truth is, the way that, you know, the most 
economically disadvantaged white man or white woman walking into a Macy's is treated by security is so different than the way that, let's say even somebody who, you know, Senator Cory Booker or Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., you know, you can recall that actual situation where police in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you know, arrested him from trying to break into his own house, you know, and this, this whole thing that, that um, was, was called, you know, eventually it was called the Beer Summit, you know, when they were invited to the White House and so forth. When you start thinking about the ways, the little ways each and every day that white people, maybe advantage isn't the best way to think about the other side of the coin in every case, but maybe thinking about the freedom from X, the freedom from harassment, the freedom from fear that if you get pulled over in a routine traffic stop because you were speeding or because you, you, know, you didn't use your blinker or what have you, that as a white person, it's very unlikely that you're gonna be inclined to think I might die. That experience, I think, is what we're talking about when we talk about the very subtle but pervasive and present, always present advantages of a systemically racist culture. And so people of color experience this all the time. They, they don't need to be reminded of the, the, you know, the, the, the oppressive side of the system. But people who benefit from it, you know, white people or people perceived as white, I think it requires a deep soul searching, a discernment, an examination of conscience, and, and a real truth telling about the way we live in the world and move in the world and think about the world. Um, and so there's more I can say about that, but I realize we're, we're really coming at time. And, and I'm so grateful for all of the many people who joined us this evening on Zoom and, and Facebook. Uh, and, and those who asked questions and, and uh, you know, I've just, I, I can't express my gratitude enough to the International Thomas Merton Society uh, and to the Bernadine Center, um, Steve Millies and Peter Cunningham and his team especially. So um, I'll let that be my last word and encourage everybody to uh, continue signing up for and tuning in for these monthly uh, Merton sessions. Uh, you're most welcome. And, and again, thank you tonight for tonight. I want to take this moment to thank Dan for his extremely insightful and inspirational talk. And um, I'd like to bring in a comment that someone on the uh, Facebook said as she was listening, and I'll give her credit for this uh, comment, which I think expresses for many of us um, our appreciation for the talk. Linda Doyle England said, this talk is what we have been waiting for. And I certainly agree with that. Uh, you've already thanked Peter Cunningham and his so-called deputies there at the Catholic Theological Union, the Bernadine Center, Nelson, Amanda, and Jessica. Peter calls himself the ghost in the machine, and without him, this couldn't have happened. He was just, he has been wonderful and continued to be with the technological side of this production. Um, I want to let you know that registration is now open for the October 13th webinar, which will feature Reverend Dr. Bonnie Thurston. And she has the very intriguing title for her talk, Almost as if I had a sister, Thomas Merton and Etta Gulick. To register, go to merton.org slash ITMS. And while you're there, you might also wish to check out the benefits of membership in the International Thomas Merton Society, unless you're already a member. The link again is merton.org slash ITMS. So goodbye, and we hope to see you all again in October. Thank you. <laughs>